I'm pleased today to uh, announce, I think, that we want to acknowledge the gift uh, Robert and Laura Johnson. They've established an endowment uh, to support the William Southern Journalism Fellow at Massey College is going to create a bursary to cover unique, unexpected or emergency expense expenses that the journalists uh, face when they are here. And I think it speaks, I know, to uh, the desire to eliminate all barriers for journalists to participate in this great experience and contribute fully to the advancement of what should be uh, the role of journalism in Canada and elsewhere around the world. So I want to say thank you so much uh, to uh, uh, Bob, as we know it, and, and Laura Johnson for uh, you know, stepping up and supporting forever uh, the William Southern Fellowship. <laughs> is well known to the journalism fellows because he's been telling them what to do for many years. He's been uh, uh, the faculty advisor to the William Southern Journalism Fellows and uh, uh, for many years. And I think we want to acknowledge the great contribution that he's made. I think every lunch, uh, Bob always asks the, the, an interesting, you know, purposive question. And I think he's supporting the program in so many meaningful ways. So I think uh, he was elected as a senior fellow in 2001. And since 2013 was, uh, has been a senior resident and the academic advisor to the William Southern Journalism Fellows. He's professor emeritus at University of Toronto and a specialist of Russia and the Cold War. We need him more than ever uh, to help us. And anyway, I just want to say, uh, Bob and Laura, I think uh, it's been uh, fabulous to be working with you all these years, and I think we are so indebted to your contribution to to the program, the strength of the program in its future. Merci beaucoup, from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. So um, <laughs> let me pass it to Hannah Hope, uh, Anna Hope, our current uh, journalism fellow, and uh, to begin Press Club tonight. Thank you very much, Natalie. Good evening. Thank you very much for choosing to spend your Wednesday night with us. We're really happy to have you all here. My name is Hannah Hogue. I am a science journalist and uh, the deputy editor of The Conversation Canada. And I'm also one of the Sears William Southern journalist, journalist, uh, Journalism Fellows. So first, a bit of history about Press Club. The Massey College Press Club was started in 2001 by journalism fellow David Napier to discuss important issues on journalism. His goal was to establish an evening where journalists of all types, from freelancers to staffers to editors and more, could come and listen to people in the business speak about journalism. Press Club gives journalists the chance to meet fellow journalists who might fall outside the usual circles and for others to understand what issues the industry is grappling with or should be. Over the past 21 years, the Press Club has held discussions on reporting on First Nations and the Idle No More movement, the language journalists use when reporting on climate change, and the many ways that COVID-19 changed journalism, just to name a few. Tonight, we have a fantastic group of panelists who will talk about the rise of online harassment of journalists and what they think should be done, both inside and outside the newsroom. A November, 21, uh, November 2021 survey conducted at Bay Epsos and done in association with a dozen news organizations and media outlets across Canada found that harassment and media harassment is prevalent and pervasive among journalists and media workers, with more than 7 in 10 reporting some form of harassment in the past year. Online harassment was the most frequent type reported. Some reporters said they had been harassed daily, or almost on an almost daily basis. A smaller but still really important number were threatened in person or on the phone. Reporters were threatened with death. Others were told their private information would be exposed. Their families were threatened. They were sent sexualized messages or images, and they were threatened with rape or sexual assault. 9% were physically attacked. Women and younger journalists, LGBTQ2 plus journalists, and journalists of color have been especially targeted by coordinated harassment campaigns. A large majority of the journalists surveyed said that the harassment had worsened in the past two years, a time point that's marked by the COVID-19 pandemic and the shift of journalists to spend more time online. Tonight, let me introduce our panelists, if I can get to the right page. <laughs> uh, 
These threats are silencing journalists and journalism. If we want to have a healthy democracy, it's important that we keep the press safe. Tonight, our panelists are going to discuss some of the measures that are underway and hear more about what journalists and organizations can do to stay safe and to maintain the health of Canada's free press. And where do we go from here? Joining us tonight, starting from the left, are Sri Paradkar, a columnist and internal ombud at the Toronto Star. We have Natasha Gersensich, who is one of the journalism fellows here at Massey College, and she's also the global. Uh, she's also the deputy editor at Vice Media. Uh, we have Brody Fenlon, the editor in chief of CBC News, where he oversees the journalism and journalistic standards for CBC's English language service and is responsible for the national network programs. And we have Steph Wexler, the managing editor of JSource, who co which covers news research and commentary about journalism in Canada. And Sharbil Namur, the he global head of security at Vice Media, is joining us by video. Our moderator tonight, as I already said, <laughs> is Natasha Grisensich. Um, we'll kick off the conversation now, and then we'll open the floor to you for your questions at the end. Before we go to questions, however, we'll have a brief reflection on the dangers that journalists face in Kenya from Wanjagatu, who is also a Massey Fellow. Natasha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and also to acknowledge uh, all the journalism fellows are here tonight. So um, after the event, if uh, you are going to stick around, we'll be in the common room and you can meet Wanja, who will also say a few words. Oh, Myra Issa. Um, I am sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, oh, no, I know, I know. I'm trying, give me the last name. Zuhal Ahad, uh, who is a journalist from Afghanistan, and Valerie Ouellet, who is a data, investigative data journalist from CBC. Uh, so please join us in the common room after and pepper them with questions if you so desire. Um, we'll spend a few minutes uh, in the beginning to hear from our panelists uh, to understand the nature of the problem of this online harassment and uh, what newsrooms are doing. And then after we'll open the discussion to the whole panel and hear what they think should, we should be doing inside and outside of the newsrooms to protect journalists. So uh, Shri is one of the few columnists of color um, in Canada. I think you can count them in one hand. <laughs> and she has been the subject of many, uh, of many, um, She's been subject of online harassment many times over. If you follow her on Twitter, you can even see some of this playing out in public. Um, Shri, can you tell us a little bit more about the nature of these threats and where they're coming from? What kinds of harassment are you facing online? Right. Um, where do I begin? Um, maybe, maybe I can begin with these are some random emails from 2016 that I, I just printed without really looking at them. So there is a bit of a content warning on them, uh, mostly anti-black and Islamophobic. So I'm going to just pass these along with, the fa with face down. And if you would rather not read them, don't. Uh, but feel free to read them and then just share them among yourselves. It's, um, and you don't have to. <laughs> Natalie's face is like, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to. So just, you know, just pass them along because they are all, they're all different. Um, the, the reason I just wanted to share them was, was to say none of them are openly threatening. None of these emails threaten to either rape me, if I remember correctly, or to kill me, which has, you know, all of that has happened, or they haven't doxed me. There have been emails where people have found out where I lived. So, or at least close to where I've lived. So, and I moved houses last year. Um, but I want you to have an example or an idea of what low level, what I, ca I call this low level abuse and what continuous low level abuse can look like. So if you are, a lot of the abuse is go back to the country you come from, which tells me that 
it's not just the message, but the messenger matters. Um, a lot of it is Islamophobic. I'm not Muslim, but I'm connected to a lot of the things I write about with, through common decency, I think. But I'm confused as Muslim because I'm brown. And uh, a lot of it is anti-black. Um, and it's not only coming from white supremacists. So I think that's the thing I want to make really clear, that today we are talking about white supremacists and the far right. A lot of this is just coming from regular readers. Um, so that, that is the level of abuse. And I want to situate this in a today in an unfolding crisis of mental health around us. So we have that. Then we have journalists who are facing abuse. I've just come out of a conference or a roundtable in Ottawa where uh, we talked about the mental health issues faced by journalists, where more than 63% said that they face online harass harassment and more than 40%, I think, said they faced it you know, on the streets. Um, and the rates of anxiety among journalists are, of, of diagnosed anxiety, are 10 times the rate of average Canadians. So there is a crisis in the profession right now. So that's where we are. I don't want to focus it too much on myself. Some of this, the emails do that. But all I want to say is that is the low level abuse and it has ratcheted up since then for nothing but the crime of doing your job. When I was doing it, a lot of it, when I got, when I got this in 2016, a lot of it was because I was challenging the status quo particularly racism or um, Islamophobia or, you know, all, all oppressions. But today, if you're a journalist, you will get abused for writing about veganism. You know, you will get, you know, climate change, um, obviously vaccinations, anything. The weather, you write about the weather, uh, you know, a junior most reporter will just will be told, can you write a weather story for the day, which is like the most harmless story you can write and you'll have climate change deniers coming out to abuse you for that. So it has changed the level. We were, in many ways, I think, journalists of color have been the canaries in the coal mine that have been ignored and invisibilized. And I wish we had not been, because we would have been, the industry as a whole would have been further ahead if only we had been listened to. So does that, did I, if I hope I didn't take up too much time. But, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Um, Steph, um, as we heard this summer, we heard a targeted campaign, what seemed like a targeted campaign uh, against journalists. Um, Omaira uh, Issa was one of those who were on a list, apparently, and uh, they reported being harassed online. And um, Trudeau even came out and condemned the pattern of harassment, calling it alarming and completely unacceptable. Um, you, I think you were compelled by this momentum, perhaps to create an online open source database to document the attacks on journalists in Canada. Um, what was your goal or what is your goal mm -hmm. of this project and where are you at with it? Yeah, so the project um, actually, the uh, the broader project is called the Canada Press Freedom Project, uh, which is going to track press freedom violations in Canada across about a dozen categories. And the project has actually been in development for about two years. Um, and in our view, online threats were always going to be um, a part of that tracking. Um, this is modeled actually on the United States Press Freedom Tracker uh, at the Freedom of the Press Foundation. Um, and they historically have not systematically tracked online threats as its own category, but given the conditions in Canada, it was pretty, uh, in our view, impossible uh, to look holistically at press freedom conditions in this country without um, examining how online threats fits fit into that wider constellation um, of both the public's right to know and journalists' own uh, safety and free expression rights. We've certainly seen since, I mean, this pattern has been like on an upward swing for many years, as Shree's already pointed out, and it's been, um, there's been very slow movement and reluctance to acknowledge the severity of the problem. Um, and we're sort of at a point where we know, you know, the point of doing this is not to say to say that we require evidence that this problem is happening. We know it's happening, but I think we also have some sense that it's important to have systematic, ongoing documentation 
of the nature of the issue and how the issue is dealt with, um, the types of threats um, that people are receiving, what's being done about them, where they're being reported, and what's happening with them when they do get reported, if they get reported, to hopefully inform a path forward to some extent, but also so we have some sense over years where this problem um, is um, concentrated and how it's changing and where it fits into the overall landscape of journalist safety and our information ecosystems overall. Do you have a sense already of what of the nature of those threats? And as Shri has mentioned, like it has been going on a long time. Yeah. Have you seen a shift, not just in volume, but in? Well, we um, know for sure. I'll, I'll note that um, our project is going to be tracking press freedom violations across these categories starting in 2021 for all of them and okay. starting in 2022 for online threats. All right. And this will be like a permanent sustained project. So in a number of years, we will be able to see that. We do know through a lot of, um, existing research and reporting and sort of snapshot um, polling um, that these problems in terms of harassment online in general, but directed at media workers has upticked dramatically during the pandemic. And we also know while this, you know, the nature of this problem isn't isolated to, you know, explicitly white supremacist movements, we do know that there is like a disproportionate amount of extremist um, activity that originates in Canada. Um, and kind of the goal is to also see how all these elements interact with one another and how they're changing over time because the trajectory doesn't doesn't look great based on where we are today. Yeah, and I, um, yeah, it's true. And I think especially after the trucker convoy um, mm -hmm. and the idea that a lot of journalists who were reporting on COVID were also being targeted because people didn't want to believe science. Mm -hmm. um, Brody, let's turn to you. There's pressure, um, sometimes unspoken, on journalists um, that they need to be on social media um, to promote their stories, their personal brand, but mm -hmm. also the company or the news organization. As head of the largest newsroom in Canada, uh, what does CBC tell its journalists about having an active social media presence? Thanks. Thanks for the question, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, we, one of the measures we took in response to this was to put out a really clear policy on the personal use of social media. Journalists have, yes, used their own social media accounts to build their brand, to engage the audience, to defend the journalism, um, to share the journalism. We used to think it was a great opportunity for sources, and primarily on Twitter. Twitter is, you know, uh, the biggest for journalists at least, the most important platform, not for the rest of the world. Uh, but uh, we changed our policy and just said, step back, uh, no expectation to be on social media, no expectation to engage. Most people in journalism have to be on there because there's a lot of news that breaks. Uh, organizations use it to communicate. But the act of engagement in that space, we, we were just really clear to say, we don't think it's healthy. If you choose to do it, you're gonna be doing it on your own don't do it for us we don't expect it and unless explicitly assigned and um so there's been a real shift and pivot in what how we're talking about it. and we've had to own to the fact that yes 10 years ago we said get on there and be there and but the platform has changed um it's an uh, often unhealthy place and uh and i just had this moment of you know we we, we were very good about being careful about sending journalists into physical spaces that are risky. And yet here journalists are spending a lot of time that are mentally risky and unhealthy. And why would we encourage that? So we, we've really been clear, but the pressure doesn't just come from newsrooms. Let's be clear. The pressure comes from journalists who some journalists uh, can't break free from the platform. It's, it's a, I'm on Twitter myself. I've been there since 2008. It's highly addictive. Um, there is a community. Sometimes journalists, share what's happening with them on Twitter as a, as a means of almost, um, you know, uh, looking and, and seeking support, which you can get, but you also have terrible stuff that happens on that platform as well. And so that, that's where we've landed. Okay, I think that's very interesting and a little bit different to, I think, the way Vice um, handles 
our social media presence. Um, I'll turn to Sharbel now, if you can turn to your screen. Um, Sharbel is the head of um, security at VICE, and his department offers training on hostile environment and first aid. But a, co a component has always been um, information and digital security. Sharbel, why do you think it's important that online safety is a part of your offerings? Like it is a mandatory training at Vice. I, I think Sri summed it up. Um, we we teach digital safety as uh, when, not if. So it's essentially everyone, anyone, anyone creating anything is eventually going to face some some form of online abuse. Is the the sad reality of of where we are we're at in the industry. So with that, it's, it doesn't do any good to kind of delineate between a physical risk and an online risk and an emotional well-being or, or mental health risk. They're, they're, all, they're all wrapped up in, in each other. So the, the safety training should re reflect that, right? So if, you know, like Shree said, any topic is, is fair game, and especially if, if um, you're, you're writing about a particular sensitive subject or you are yourself a, a minority or, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't even have to go very far. It can be... You mentioned some of the topics. Um, Taylor Swift's not not her latest album, but the one before that. I think we had <laughs> se seven or eight death threats, legitimate death threats that we had to you know liaise with with authorities on, which is which is just asinine, right? Like that, that, that's that's ludicrous to think of that, that that's where we're at, where we're discussing uh, women's hockey tournaments, you know, resulting in long term harassing and relocation aspects and things like that. So, I if, if I don't think I'm answering your question exactly Tosh but but the the reason we we incorporate it in so so heavily and you know it's it's not its own isolated component is because we we see it in every single aspect of what we do uh no I think that is a fine answer and I'll, I'll go back to Shri and Shri and our staff I'm happy to have either of you or both of you answer what is the impact of these threats as, um, on you as a journalist, but also on the industry. Uh, has it changed the way that you do journalism? Have you considered leaving the profession? I know that you might not have, but others have. Um, are stories going untold? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I consider leaving all the time. Um, except that I have no other skill. So you know, this is the <laughs> only thing I can do. And, um, you know, yeah. So there's a lot of vulnerability there as an immigrant without networks, you know, not sure. Like, I don't know if I can get another job, have kids, blah, blah, anyway. Um, so yeah, daily consider leaving, but I don't. Uh, certainly I've left, I have withdrawn from uh, a lot of, social media profiles. Um, and certainly there are subjects that I think twice about um, writing. I haven't yet not written about something, but I have to brace myself a lot more now. And I've started giving myself the time before interviews and after interviews to sit down and just gather myself because every interview also has its own impact on you before you even take it to the editor. And then the editors, you know, the editing process can be very uh, enervating um, and then the pushback, you know, so then after the pushback, so sometimes I have to factor in time for all of that. And we're not in a profession where we have a lot of time. I don't shop in my own name. Um, I've completely changed. There's no photos of, I hope there's no photos of my children around. I know there was one where I had posted one on, on Twitter um, of my kids at the Raptors parade with uh, Masai Ujiri, because one of them said something sweet to Ujiri and it was this like nice photo. And years later, like a couple of uh, months later, I had to go take it down because I realized they had their school jerseys uh, on, you know? So yeah, so I think the one photo that I had made me kind of vulnerable and it promptly led to emails from people suggesting that they knew where I was. They were asking, did you hear about this accident that happened on this street? Did you know? So yeah, so it has changed. You know, there's a lot of lot of things that I just don't do. I don't put my name down on even mailing packages. Um, because the problem is, 
you know, as journalists, we are not celebrities that we, you know, reap any benefits from being known, but you just have the sort of your, your, you might be known to the wrong person, you know, so it's not about, yeah, it's the possibility of being known to the wrong person, which makes it, you know, so uh, dangerous. So yeah, it has had an impact, definitely. And and then that's on me, but also I know on others, I part of my job at the Star is also as an internal ombud where I'm, you know, talking to other journalists uh, who are marginalized and I am part of the chain of command for, you know, for journalists who face abuse. And it takes a toll. It takes a toll when you're on a list, when there is a list made with your name on it, when you are told exactly how you are going to be gang raped, when you're told, you know, what they are going to do to you. None of this is just, there's nothing virtual about it. You know, you could be sitting on your phone and just, you know, thinking you're at home and you're in your safe space in a sanctuary. And some, if you don't have your notifications off, something like that can pop up. It's an invasion, right? So, there is a toll, there is a lot of trauma. And um, and I fear for the future because, you know, we're talking about um, social media policies and journalists my age, we, we are not digital natives. So some of us, had, you know, went to social media to promote our stories. But, you know, the new generation that has a social media profile, like they, that uses TikTok as uh, a search engine, they're going to come with very clear ideas of expressing themselves on social media. And now they're going to enter a place where if they want to be journalists, they are being told, don't be there or don't express yourself or, oh, this is going to make you vulnerable in this way or that. And so, so much of our approach to social media as well is, you know, it still is going to require so much more work and continuous effort because, um, you know, we, we are, we are, constantly playing catch up. I don't think we are even near where we should be. Steph, do you have anything to add? Yeah, um, I'll try to think of the fewest possible things to add. But <laughs> yeah. one of one thing I would say is that, of course, like that's the goal, right? When people are targeting media workers and the media workers that they're targeting, the goal of, is the chilling effect. Um, and that's unfortunately the risk that we're seeing play out. And I'll also speak to a little bit of what Charbel addressed, which is this idea that the, there is a very like thin membrane between the physical and the virtual. And I sort of get the sense from, you know, talking to people, a lot of people over the years about this specific issue is that we've been very late um, in general in the scheme of things, but in this country in particular to accept how interrelated virtual and physical realms are. We've seen this kind of play out in the most like visceral and obvious way, I'd say particularly around the convoy um, events. Um, and that sort of when I think the rubber hit the road and a lot of people kind of undeniably could see what that linkage was, but people have been warning about that for a long time. The evidence that that already does happen and will continue to happen was already there. Um, but we are certainly at a place where I think we, it's really urgent to like build that digital security capacity locally. Um, and the last thing that I'll say if I can really quickly is this idea, I mean, when we're talking about social media policies and being able to withdraw, um, to some extent, that's a conversation we can have for people who are full-time staff. Um, it's a luxury to some extent to be able to have that conversation. We have a growing workforce of freelance and contract media workers who require those platforms to build the audience that enables them to get hired. Um, and so not to like jump the gun too much until later in the conversation, but I think part of what's really going to be necessary is looking at this issue in a really collaborative, like inter-newsroom way because we're all kind of at the whims of the same environment. Mm -hmm. um, so I think to say that some people can kind of pull back is not really looking at the picture overall when some people need to connect with sources that way, they need to build their engagement and it's really just not a space they can leave. No, and I, I know this is also a very uh, pa uh, passionate subject for Sharbel. so I'm sure when we talk mm -hmm. about freelancers, he'll, um, He'll get into that. But I wanted to go a little bit up to the repercussions for the journalism. Brody, how do you see these online threats affecting the quality of journalism at CBC? Does it, do they affect mm. the quality of journalism? 
And what does CPC do when a journalist uh, faces online harassment? So first of all, um, it, everything we do kind of begins and ends with uh, this pivot to say this is no longer the cost of doing business. I mean, I wrote an editor's blog in the beginning of the year about the, the increase in harassment that our journalists are facing. I tweeted it out. Uh, <laughs> a retired journalist replied to my tweet, and, and I'm paraphrasing, but the, the gist was, uh, suck it up. Um, journalists have been harassed for a long time. I was in my day. And uh, toughen up or, you know, if you can't take the heat, get out of the kitchen. I didn't reply, but if, if I would, I, I would say you're, he's absolutely completely wrong. It is different. It, he was not accessed in his home on personal devices. There are a million ways to reach in digitally to people's lives. Um, frankly, as a, a white man, he would never experience the kind of um, vicious misogyny, uh, racism, uh, violence. Uh, he would never face coordinated campaigns um, where there's some kind of scary, sinister stuff happening and collaboration. So no, it's not like it was back in the day. It's very different. And I, by the way, I'm saying this really mindful of the fact I don't want to scare people off yes. journalism I, and I don't want Shri to leave. And I don't want, I mean, really, because it's an amazing profession. It is so important. There is still so much joy to be had in telling stories and People should never lose sight of that, but we are facing challenges we're not used to. Um, that journalist in back in the day also had general respect in the community. There would be people who wouldn't be happy with reporting, but he wasn't seen as an enemy. And that is a new dynamic as well, where we are uh, traditional media, mainstream media are being set up by various actors as a threat and as an enemy, uh, simply for being an institution. So having said that, how does it affect our journalists? I mean, it is, it's, it's everything from, uh, the, the big fear of course is the chilling effect. It is intimidation and it do, that getting you to think twice, should I do this? Am I gonna wear the CBC gem out in public? My goodness, I feel that sometimes. I, I have a great CBC gem on my bag, <laughs> but I'm aware of it. And especially when I'm with my kids, I'm aware that I might be targeted because I now, I, I now proudly, still proudly wear that gem outside, but what a crazy dynamic. And, and even for us, we've had to consider when do we take our branding off vehicles, for instance, when we're going into scenes. Um, we don't, we actually remove branding from our vehicles because we'll know it will be targeted. Um, so a lot of uh, what we've done, a lot of conversation about it, acknowledging it's real, it's not good, we have to uh, take ownership. We've done training. We've, uh, I mean, in the beginning, we didn't know who do you turn to when this happens to you. So we've consolidated all that one shop, st uh, stop shop in terms of um, access to a security. Um, we've uh, created a position around well being and, and mental health. Dave Seglins, who Shri, you met at that summit, uh, whose job is just about supporting journalists and finding ways that we can. Um, help alleviate some of the, the uh, mental trauma that you might encounter or experience as you do the job. Uh, I have a list of things, but um, the, there also is an element of whack-a-mole. And, and so, yeah, my, my suggestion, by the way, around Twitter and, and social media is just one thing. Those platforms have a role as well. Mm -hmm. Our president has been very active in engaging Google, Facebook, Twitter, and saying, um, step up and introduce tools and how do we have a, a relationship with you uh, so we can flag things early. But, um, but as anyone who's been a victim of it, is, it, it comes at you in a million ways. So, you know, we turned off comments on our Facebook stories because our staff were encountering all kinds of horrific stuff there. Then you have people who can just reach you directly on email. So while you can curtail that email or you can have someone vet it, you can try to screen it out. You can't, they can't track them because they use anonymous uh, email. Twitter is its own thing. Um, it's just, it's, it's an endless kind of battle, uh, but we are much, we're in a much better place. And one of the uh, uh, final things I'll just say is that the industry has got its act together now and is speaking as one 
CBC has been a big part of commissioning um, and, and helping commission that IPSO survey. There's another one in the field we have right now in partnership with uh, Sunnybrook about the mental health of online or the mental impact of online harm, raising awareness of these issues and also communicating, uh, hopefully, so people hear the challenges of reporting to police. Um, you know, there aren't very many great tools to, to deal with this stuff legally, um, criminally. So it's not just news media who are trying to get their heads around it. Government has to, police have to. Yeah, and we'll get to that too. I am, I'd love to hear from Sharbel if this sounds very familiar. Is there anything that you'd like to add? Um, how does his, how uh, Brody laid that out of what happens at the star, how does that differ at Vice? And also thinking about this duty of care, when does that start and end um, for a journalist? I'll start off by saying I, I really wish I was there in person. If you could see my body language, I was perking up through through everyone talking. <laughs> These are some great panelists that, that are up there. Um, I'm, I'm kind of the floating head that's, that's disconnected, but some amazing comments. <laughs> Um, to go back to Steph's, that, that's when I first worked up, the osmosis between the digital bleeding over into the digital and vice versa. I, I think also it's it's equally important to point out the osmosis that's for lack of membrane, basically, between the digital and the emotional and the the, the, the mental well-being aspect of it. Because everyone everyone has a hesitation when, when they come to me like, oh, Charvel, I don't want to I don't want to bring this up because I'm not getting shot at in Ukraine or you know there there's that perceived and it doesn't matter if it's a perceived risk to you, then it's real, you know, it, ipso facto. It, it kind of just speaks for itself. If, if like Shree is saying, you know, so, some of those more heinous threats and things like that, it doesn't matter if the capability is not there or if the actual intent's not there. If it's real to your lizard brain, if you've, you've gone into that flight or fight response, it's real, it's a real threat. And, and there's a hesitation around that. I think Brody, to your point, because Bruce Shapiro, Dart Center, uh, Columbia University, he likes to start. He likes to start a lot of meetings around the fact that that there are tons of issues, a lot of problems out there, but the journalists are also amongst some of the most creative and resilient and and solution oriented people, you know, in any in industry. And, and so I, th I think that leverage is also what gets us out of so many problems, but then kind of pushes away some of the, the threats and things like that. So I think there's a balance to be done there. So absolutely 100% with you, really like to, to bring people in and not scare them off. And that's hopefully what we always try and do on on empowering and, and giving them support so they don't feel that isolating effect. Natasha, I'm now so off your question that I, I've <laughs> lost track. But the, the, du the duty of care, the duty yeah. of care aspect is, is I think where you originally wanted me to go. Um, and, 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 and I think because of that, because, because of the osmosis or, or lack of osmosis, just a total, I, I actually think of it just as a whole. I, I don't actually think of it as, as subdivided by any membrane at all. I think the duty of care for, for this, has a lot longer tail than than say duty of care going to Ukraine or or Afghanistan or something. It, it has the same duty of care that mental health does, which is indefinite, right? So I do think that the duty of care, and, and this is hard for for orgs and benefit programs and and everyone to get HR systems to get their head around, but that duty of care extends to the mental well being of that person impacted by the event that they were reporting on in the digital sense, right? So I think I think what you're seeing is all of a sudden a duty of care that we fought long and hard to establish just in the pure physical sense, right? Like that's that's been a struggle just to get the industry as a whole to come up and face what other industries do around duty of care, right? For for physical safety, for physical security when you're out doing your job, that's been a struggle. I, I think we're slowly making headway and in, in everyone accepting there's a duty of care around that, and now we're saying. But actually, we need to extend that indefinitely out into the future because it's a it's an aggregate, you know, it's a cumulative effect that that these micro traumas, these micro you know messages have on on you over and over again, like like Tree's describing. So it could be a year out from here that you know after we've commissioned you, after the piece is run, after all that, and and there's a tailing effect where the, the online abuse has continued, where you've circulated back up to a Reddit channel or or you know, someone's posted on, on Parler and, and that's reignited it. So well after that, you have any ties. And I, I think that that's the next challenge is how can news orgs as a whole extend extend that duty of care all the way into the foreseeable future, right? I'll pause because that's a very long run on. 
No, I think that's a really uh, good segue into our um, something that Steph mentioned. We've been talking mostly about what newsrooms can be doing about staff. What are the obligations to the people who do not work in the newsroom, um, the freelancers, the contractors, the students who are wanting to build their name? Um, how do you have an answer for that? Like, what are some of the things that we can do to protect them? Um, and that's open to any panelist. My answer will be very protracted, so I think I'll wait until other people have had a minute. So. I think uh, all um, legacy media organizations can certainly, at the very least, have a benefits, a benefits plan for freelance and precariously placed journalists. Uh, something, not an EAP, but something that actually gives them access to um, a therapist of their choice and not like $300 because I think partial care is worse than, uh, you know, nothing at all. Uh, like a good, you know, a generous one, because we all benefit from their labor. Um, and the least we can do is support them. I, I don't have a great answer to that, except to say that if society believes that anyone doing journalism is an important part of democracy and deserves to be thought of differently, uh, and protected in some way, then that will benefit all. And, and, and so that gets into policy and that gets into policing and that gets into the law. But, but I would hope that this is seen as just not a, an issue around people's mental health and well-being, but it's actually about the fundamental underpinnings of democracy. And it's about the fourth estate and it's, um, and it's being undermined and uh, attacked. Uh, through the people who do the job. So regardless of whether you're full-time or freelancer. So that's, I, I guess, a maybe pithy, but I think that is what the debate is really needs to be about. Yeah, so you're going to, I, you're going to hate me because I dragged us prematurely to the freelancer issue and I'm going to drag us somewhere else a little bit. But I would just, I would echo the idea that the duty of care doesn't end for a lot of, at any particular point for staff or freelancers for a lot of, the reasons we've already discussed and kind of just uh, developing what I was saying earlier a little bit that freelancers, whether we're talking about, you know, uh, in the grander scheme of things, when they're working with or for a specific publication in a given moment, um, we can talk about that instance, let's say that someone is harassed in the course of their work with a given outlet, regardless of what their contractual relationship is to that organization, they're experiencing online violence in an ecosystem that we are all part of and responsible for addressing and figuring out solutions for. What I mean by that is I think that there's, you know, we're kind of at a point where I think individual newsrooms uh, sort of to Brody's point are kind of getting to a point where there is there are people who are attached. There's kind of a chain of command when dealing with specific issues and there is kind of a process for how to deal with things. I think there's other newsrooms that remain further behind. Um, and I think to the extent that, you know, people are not, because we're not talking about places with borders, we're talking about online spaces where anyone exists. I think it's probably in everyone's best interest to figure out ways to be more collaborative um, in terms of sharing resources um, with individuals, with other organizations. And I also want to say just to build on the duty of care aspect, I don't think it just ends when we're talking about this specific issue. I think that um, I'm sure, you know, what we what I imagine we're seeing in individual places and across the board is figuring out the extent to which there's trust for individuals to even go to their employers or publishers when they're working on a specific story or in the course of their you know regular employment and we do know that there has been some um in, in some cases reluctance to engage with their employers on uh, issues of online abuse and any number of other things and we think part of the bigger question is looking at why that is and what newsrooms need to be doing to foster more trust with whether it's freelancers or staff in terms of newsroom culture dynamics and frankly coverage what are what editorial approaches might um, you know contribute to the environment that we're dealing with, and in what ways do they create trust or take away trust when people need to deal with um, 
with editors or publishers when they're trying to find safety at work. Thank you. Uh, Sharbel, do you have anything to add before we go to the audience? Let's go to the audience because otherwise I'll, I'll get back up on my soapbox and not stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, just before we do that, uh, we'll hear a little bit from Wanja. I think that is a nice segue because we are dealing with uh, a borderless space. So uh, Wanja wanted to say a few words about how this context even applies to what's happening in Kenya. Wanja. <laughs> Thank you, Hannah. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, you know, listening to the panelists uh, talk, someone might think that we sat down and we wrote a collective uh, speech, or maybe we shared notes because the same same things <clears throat> that I would like to speak about are the same same things that you're bringing up. Because my point is that uh, what is happening here in Canada is not unique because these are the same same things that we're dealing with in my own home country, where uh, journalists are being attacked on a daily basis. And what is worse is that uh, these attacks are not just ending online, they are following them home. And you know, I am, I am from uh, Nairobi, Nairobi is my city, and I, I might be remiss if I didn't uh, take a moment and say that I'm deeply saddened by the death, shooting to death this week of, of uh, uh, journalist uh, Ashad Sharif, who was shot dead in Nairobi, I think Monday or Sunday night, uh, he was there to do a story and he ended up dead. Now, what is so frustrating is that this story is not new. It has been told time and time again. Every single day you wake up, go to work, expecting to go back home, but some of us don't make it back. Uh, just last year, a colleague of mine with whom we have shared a desk, done stories together, same bit, same stories, was my dad. He was following a story. He was lured from his home and he was killed. So the stories we are talking about here, these problems we face, they start online, you get attacked, you get a message, you get a threat, and you might just think, come to the work comes with the job. So you go home and you think you're safe. We're not. And so uh, <clears throat> in 2019, the Association of Media Women of Kenya carried out a research to find out how bad this thing is for journalists, especially women, because we, we are targeted for one reason or the other, because probably people think that we are weaker, we crumble easy, and when you're threatened, we scare easily. So 75% of the journalists that were asked to say how they were, they were experiencing this said, yes, we've been attacked, we've been sexualized, we've been vandalized, we've been hacked, and our accounts have been, have been receiving countless messages of, 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 of distressing uh, type and character. Some of them have had their private images taken and, and uh, manipulated and then sent out to people, to groups of people, you know, the way you send mass emails. So you wake up in the morning and what you're finding in, on your inbox is photographs of you in, in very unflattering, uh, you know, um, places. So a lot of journalists are deciding to quit. One of the journalists I spoke to uh, just before I came in September, we, 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 we had our elections in August. And during this time, everything just went haywire because there were people out to frighten, to scare, to antagonize, and, and to make journalists look bad. And this onslaught was being uh, led, sorry to say, by my own president-elect, who, just like uh, Trump, Duterte, and all the others who were coalescing around the media and, and uh, vilifying us for doing our job, was calling journalists, individual journalists, and saying that they were biased. So as a result of this talk and this conversation that were being made publicly, journalists were targeted and they were attacked physically. 
some of them, according to, to the media council, had um, their cameras broken. They had their cars vandalized. Some were beaten up and chased out of places. So uh, the public will read from, from their leaders. And they're like, wow, it's open season. So any journalist you see is under attack. The attack is coming from all corners. So um, <clears throat> the Media Council and the Association of Media Women of Kenya has reacted by uh, trying to create awareness to tell journalists, OK, listen here, guys. There is no story worth dying for. If you're under attack, back away. But in my thinking, this tells me that this is exactly what those attacking journalists want us to do. They want us to uh, fall back and say, we are scared. We are no longer talking. And so when we are silent, because we, as far as I'm concerned, I think the journalists are the last line of defense. When you are quiet about what is going on, what is happening to us, then you open the door for everybody else to be attacked. And when that time comes, democracy cannot stand. The rule of law cannot stand. And so many of us will, 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 will perish. I shudder to think about what will happen when journalists cannot be allowed to do their work. Because we are the people who tell the society, you know, growing up and I wanted to be a journalist. OK, I wanted to be a lawyer, profession. <laughs> but then I couldn't get into college because I, I didn't make the mark. And so I ended up uh, being a journalist because um, my mother happened to know some guy who was a principal at a school that was teaching journalism. So I went there. But when I got there, I discovered that, oh, lawyers are engaged in advocacy. Lawyers talk about rights. We journalists do the same. The only thing is that we're not doing it in court. We are doing it on the streets. Now, on the streets, usually, we used to call it uh, fighting in the trenches because there are no rules. The rules of the game are anybody can draw those. So <clears throat> back then, the most someone would do to you is tell you, I don't like what you wrote, uh, file a retraction. And so you'd normally go back to the newsroom and say, I've received this and that commentary. This story is not looking good, so I will file a retraction. This time around, they are not asking for retraction. They are, they, are, they are asking for blood. You do something I don't like, I'm going to come after you, and I'm going to kill you if I don't hurt you. So. I stand here today uh, feeling threatened, totally threatened. You know, I, I, I think I was telling Val and colleagues that I don't scare easily. I have been through things, and I, it doesn't scare me. But what terrifies me is that someone can be doing things online. Because online, what happens is that there's a more flyer effect. You know, oh, if you disagree with me one on one, we can have a spot and we can talk about it one on one. But online, there's a multiplier effect. You know, I was listening to Maria Ressa the other day at the room, speaking to Omaira, Omaira, who is also experiencing kind of harassment. And Maria Ressa is saying that she receives 90 hate messages every hour. So multiply that by a day you'll find that she's dealing with 5,400 hate messages every day. Even the strongest among us cannot stand that. It will drive you crazy. It's just getting to me. It's getting to your head. It's getting to your motivation. You feel like, uh, if I don't quit tomorrow, then I'm going to kill someone. This is not where we want to go. We, we want to be able to have a civil encounter with one another, agree to disagree, and move forward. So now, uh, moving forward, I spoke to Ahad, uh, my dear friend from Afghanistan. She found me writing uh, this that I'm going to read here. And so I told her, I'm, I'm writing about what is going on in Kenya. So I asked her, what about you? She told me, I have been attacked so much, I had to flee my country. Someone sent her a, a message saying, I am going to come after you. I will kill your father. I will kill your husband because of a story that she has written. So where are we going? As a people, uh, in my summation, it has come a time where we can no longer sit still and argue that uh, this is uh, random. What is happening is not random. It is targeted. It is calculated. And the people behind this thing will stop at nothing because they want to, to maintain the status quo because they benefit from it. 
you know, you listen to Trump talking and you, you hear what they're trying to, to drive. They're dividing people along racial lines. Listen to Duterte talking. He's driving, dividing people uh, uh, along class lines, arguing that uh, I, I will sit in my room and decide that you're a drug peddler and therefore I kill you, you have no right to life. I listened to my own president elect uh, Ruto. He has been held before the criminal court for crimes against humanity. He does not want journalists who can critique and expose these things that they are doing. So these are consortium of like-minded people who are saying, we do not want the truth to come out. And how are they coming after you? They go after you while you're most vulnerable. We're spending a lot of time online. We Google online, we work online, we email online, we communicate online. And so now, because the attack is calculated and relentless and very consistent, you know, again, I go to Maria Ressa, I listened to her and I was like, wow, she said this. In their research, they have found that 26 vloggers with an agenda to misinform, to disinform, and to attack, and to, to you know, generally uh, destroy people's reputations, have the effect, the impact of influencing 3 million people at any given time. Think about those numbers. It tells you that the assault is an avalanche. So we cannot afford to sit back and say, we are going to play catch up. We have no time. We do not have the time to sit around and say, we're going to play catch up, or we're going to act half-hearted, or we're going to start saying, oh, journalists must not work online. Why? Why when the information platforms are changing and they're demanding that we are constantly keeping pace with what is happening? So media houses cannot afford to say, oh, that is your problem. We didn't ask you to go there. Sorry, sir, no offense. But I've, I've been saying that this thing, the approach is not sustainable. We, we know what we are up against and we must respond accordingly. So from where I stand, I'll be like, I may not have the tools to go after those who are attacking other journalists online, but I might say this, that I am going to keep doing my job and doing it well. The rest of us have a duty to do a job Call those people in, in, in government to attention, hold them to account, and tell them this is not going to work. Now, those of us who are in positions of power, people who have the, the duty of, of care, like uh, my friend uh, Natasha is saying, we're calling you to order and saying, if you sit back and let those people who are enemies of democracy and justice over, over run us, you're next. Because when they're out of people to fix it, people to hurt us, who are they going to come after? They will come after our bosses. So it is about time that we all sit together, talk together, and say, this cannot be allowed to continue. Because in any case, nobody has a monopoly of opinion. We live in a, in a, in a global world order these days. We are saying we, we, are, we are a universal, I mean, are we a global democracy? That I can talk to you wherever you're at. I can hear your opinion wherever you're at. So how is it then a group of people who want to propagate their own selfish interests can be allowed to bring this whole thing down? Wanja, Wanja, we can go on and yeah. we, we should. So please talk to Wanja when we are <laughs> um, yeah. after this evening, but we would like to also get to um, the questions from the audience, yeah. um, if that's okay. Thank you. I am so passionate about this. <laughs> day, but anyway, thank you. So if anyone has questions, just raise your hand and I'll bring you the mic. Hi, thanks very much for an interesting discussion. Um, so the, the discussion tonight has really focused on attacks on journalists themselves. And I think, you know, one thing that worries me is as journalists, we rely on other people to talk to us. And those other people are not used to that low level amount of abuse that we get day to day. And uh, so I wondered whether the panel could address, you know, what as journalists and as institutions we can do to help protect the sources that are not not used to this kind of this kind of thing. Well, that's a 
I mean, I'll, I'll start because th this was one of the reasons we stopped allowing comments on Facebook under our stories because we had sources who were being targeted online for speaking to us and first and, and campaigns building within the comment section of Facebook. Uh, it's a new phenomenon. Val was just telling me about um, the challenge of getting medical uh, experts or research experts to, to speak on the record for fear of being targeted. Uh, so again, a new phenomenon for us. There's a duty of care for sources as well as for journalists. Um, and, you know, we, we, we've, we feel that most obvious in places where, for example, in Russia, where we're we know that we're putting people at risk if they talk to us on the record and we do a lot of coaching around what to expect, what are you comfortable with. But now that's extending to just regular people in this country who aren't uh, living under uh, a threat of the state, but a threat of whoever else is out there. So um, again, it's a kind of a new phenomenon, but it's a very real consideration and we're seeing that more and more. Um, can I jump in just a uh, quick comment? One is I want to situate what's happening to journalists. It's also happening to doctors. It's happening to nurses. It's happening to academics. So I'm hoping that this discussion, not this discussion alone, but everything we are doing as an industry has effects and impacts beyond just the media. Uh, but it's a very good question about duty of care. Um, I, you know, institutionally, I think Brody spoke about what, what they do, but as a, as a journalist, what I do is I now, when I speak to sources who are uh, vulnerable by identity, I make it a point to explain to them what can happen. I was speaking to a man who has recently immigrated from Cameroon, talking about uh, anti-black racism his child was facing in school, and he told me his child's name. and. It wars with my instinct as a journalist. I'm like, yeah, I've got everything. I've got parental consent. But I said, are you sure you want your child's name? And he said, yeah, why? I have done nothing wrong. And again, I'm like, okay, so I've done my duty, but not really. So I said, uh, I, I said, it's entirely your choice. It's in, very much in my interest to have your child's name there. But just so you know, this is something that will remain on Google. And while it doesn't affect you today, this is how your child will be identified in the future. Uh, so just think it through. And he did. And he said, okay, we'll withhold the child's name. And I have I feel no guilt about it, which I should have, but I, I don't. Um, you know, because I do think it's our duty to explain to our sources who may not be media literate, what are some of these repercussions? You know, if I can add to that, I think it's similar to freelancers um, mm. who are not necessarily, um, they might be new writers and might not have the backing of the newsroom. So it's also important to say, hey, you're going to be writing about this topic. This might happen to you. Yeah. And to actually um, set out some of the problems that could happen so that there is an understanding of um, what they might face. and. As Shui said, like I also don't have regrets. I have regrets for the people I didn't do that for mm -hmm. and then watch them get slaughtered by something so innocent like Ben Shapiro retweeting a story where you know he's doing it not to because he agrees with it, but because he knows his followers are now going to start attacking that journalist. So yeah, I think it extends um, to like as an editor, I, th I think about not just the people who I'm working with, but also the people who I'm engaging with as freelance. Can we can we bump that up just a little bit more and say that like that that's actually where journalism dies if it continues on its current trajectory? And as in, we're talking about online harassment, but the online safety in in many countries, like was referenced, is is not there, there is no more anonymity. Um, the the digital the digital investigation devices on the other side, the, the violent side have gotten so good that there is no no such thing as anonymity anymore, right? Even though newsrooms takes measures and pixelate and, and all that, there is no such thing as anonymity, especially online. So essentially any source is now, is now targetable online. Whether or not we've taken the precautions or not, just contextually, any source, if it's of a regime that's capable enough or a faction that's capable enough, you know, think of ISIS, Daesh, uh, KSA, you, you, you name it, anyone anyone that actually has the capabilities can find basically anyone because of the online footprint now. 
And there's no way that these source, individual sources without any backing or training or support are going to be able to get their, their InfoSec parameters up in time to, to stop that coming down from them. It's going to eventually lead to just why, why would you ever, ever as a source speak, speak with a journalist? Mexico, I mean, you, you pick, you pick very broad ranging subjects and it's, it's just there, there's no way to, to do it. We've even seen a shift from anonymity to sources wanting to adopt a, a public forum protection package as in get as many interviews out there on public record as possible. Get my name out there, get my cause out there as many times. So if I am disappeared, at least there's a trace of me left opting over that because the anonymity thing doesn't work anymore from, from a digital security perspective. Other questions? It's interesting. My question actually in some ways follows that, but it may have been preempted. Uh, to what extent can we do journalism with or without our names? Is this a potential solution? So we obviously, if you're a television presenter, that's difficult, but The Economist has, you know, they're not publishing their authors. Is this a potential solution? What is gained and what is lost if we don't publish with our names on stories? Potentially safety to be gained, but if we have credibility with our name, does that go? Is this a potential solution? Um, this is the sort of question, what do we gain or lose if we publish or do not publish under our names? Um, go, go for it. Well, I mean, I, mean, I was I, I, taking CBC's logo off a vehicle was the last thing I, I would have been the last to do. I think it's so important to be visible, to own the journalism you do and stand up for it. And, and of course, at a time where trust is being deliberately and com constantly eroded by that, you know, you, you, everything that undermines trust or helps make it more difficult to trust because you can, it's anonymized, makes it more difficult. So it's a really interesting, difficult um, challenge. I, I, so I personally, I, I don't, I'd rather try to figure out how do we fix society? How do we get uh, lawmakers to take this threat seriously than get to the point where it's nameless journalism happening by nameless uh, people? But that's, I mean, it's just my own, my own view. Yeah. Are there I, any other questions yeah. before we, oh, it is one. Fascinating panel, thank you. Um, I guess my question is uh, related to uh, the role of platforms in this. Uh, this. This is kind of sort of the elephant in the room. We're talking about Twitter and Facebook. And if you're sort of playing in an area where people aren't playing fair, you go to the referee. And currently it seems like referees are very much asleep at the wheel here. So I, I guess my question is, is are there any sort of, um, uh, you know, having lived through this, are there is there a wish list of things that you would like to see the engineers at Twitter or Facebook come out and say, okay, we've built this thing, it's not perfect, but it should help this part of the problem. Um, tell us what you think and we'll keep trying to make it better. Like, what does that wish list look like um, from the perspective of journalists who are on the receiving end, a lot of, of you know, this, this low quality abuse as you're describing it? Mm -hmm. See, I wish it was that the referees were asleep at the wheel. It's, they profit from this kind of engagement the platform is set up to um, it, it uh, benefits you if you engage in a fight if i if i argue with somebody i can see that my the number of followers go up um, and if i just have like a measured statement then yeah whatever so it's not in their interest and i have been involved in discussions with some of with you know two of the platforms you mentioned and one of them actually has Maxime Bernier's former advisor in a very senior position. So, so you know, so what? So we're talking. We're, we're not talking about all of us are on the same side. We all see the same problem, and we all see it as a problem. We're all we talk, systems are humans. Institutions are made up of humans who, many of whom, have sympathies with the people who are organizing coordinated attacks. So. I don't see, I don't, I, I'm too cynical to actually have a wish list with the, you know, with them, yeah. Does anyone want to add to that before we go to last words from the panel? 
um, I'd only say briefly, just in terms of the tracking work that we're about to be doing, if it's of interest that that's one of the part of the sets of questions that we're going to be asking people is wh on what platform did you receive the threat? Um, and was it reported? And among the options for whom it was reported to is the company. So I think that we're hoping that over time, that'll sort of bear out um, where these um, threats and the most noxious abuse is being concentrated and what, if any, accountability there is to be gleaned. I totally agree with um, what she was talking about in terms of it being in the interest of the companies to continue to foment what is taking place, but we'll at least have data to show what is not being done in the event that that is what bears out. And Natalie, if you allow me one last yes, question. Yes. Uh, I'd love to hear from you all after that very fruitful and thoughtful discussion. Um, if you could only focus on one aspect um, and one thing to keep journalists safe, what would that be? And we'll hear from each of you. So you can also change it up. Aspirational or, <laughs> aspirational or realistic? Either. I think it'd be nice to hear a bit of both. Charbel, since you seem to have thoughts. <laughs> uh, so definitely in the aspirational category. Um, get rid of anonymity on the internet. <laughs> he said get rid of anonymity on the internet for those who missed it. Um, I'll go, mine's aspirational too. And it's kind of an answer to the last question, two questions ago. My wish list actually is for us, the users of the platform to ask ourselves, what are we doing? And there, and to be, to, to reflect on the polarization that pulls all of us, that makes all of us angry, that makes all of us, uh, because we've talked about, you know, extremists on, and, and there are extremists on both sides, let's be clear, but there are a lot of people who are, attack and are angry and fight and um, and and make enemies where there's just disagreement. And somehow I think that's something we all need to kind of own. And what are we doing on these platforms and how do we personally engage when we disagree with someone there? Is there a way to, to bridge some of this separation that contributes to the hostility we see in, in public discourse? I'm going to disagree with a smile. Uh, because, I'm getting a lot of that today. <laughs> because, no, only because I don't think there are extremists on both sides. I think there are people with extreme views on both sides, uh, on every side of every topic. But I think when we talk about extremists, we're talking about a violence, element of violence attached and an element yeah. of entitlement attached. Um, and it's one thing to be angry when you're fighting for your rights. And it's one another thing to be upset at because you don't want to give up your power. Um, so I think those are the two sides um, that we see at war. What I would like to see change and related to what I just said, one thing would be for all newsrooms to understand that their editorial judgment is now a workplace safety decision. So it's not just up to social media companies. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, extre extremely that um, and the only other things I'd say resources uh, towards the cultivation of um, digital security literacy in Canada and across newsrooms and kind of to that point resources towards ongoing and systematic coverage of online radicalization and extremism um, which affects the environment that allows the stuff to exist and get worse. Great. Um, and my one ad would be money, <laughs> actual money for a proper therapist. Uh, it is not just a $300 or go to see, go see your EAP. It could be at the start. They have a $5,000 uh, annual benefit for mental health per I, family member per family member okay. that's unheard of but that's what i think that's not even aspirational it's being no, done so yeah. that is my wish uh thank you so much i hope you enjoyed the discussion we will continue in the common room but first well first obviously i want to thank you Ash, for doing this and uh, all of you for being here and for fabulous panelists i we can see 
that this discussion needs to go on and needs to go on for uh, many more uh, times. I think we may think about having uh, part two. <laughs> uh, I could see how there were just uh, lots of solutions that were starting to evolve and that may warrant some further discussion. So for tonight, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, enlightening us and also making us think and uh, having a little bit of a preview of what we should continue to work for and wish for. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay.